Um, I'm going to interject for just a minute because it looks like it is actually recording this perhaps now and just say that um, we, we've been looking at some stuff on Perlito and we started out by looking at um, some slides that Ingi put together describing um, his work on uh, what he's calling Perl 11, um, either seriously or jokingly has yet to be seen. And then, uh, and then Rainey was talking about some of his ideas for optimizing um, Perl 5 and 6 both as well. Ingi's approach was a higher level, non-guts type approach, as we've said before. And uh, Rainey's approach may have been more lower level, if you consider it that way. And then, I guess, the Perlito approach is kind of a, is more a higher level approach, is that Am I inter interpreting that correct? It's closer to what Ingi's talking about. Is that correct? Uh, source to source. Source to source. I'm not sure. <laughs> Basically, Perlito is uh, per five in per five. And, uh, so it's, yeah, uh, it's a way to start. Like if you, uh, you only have to implement the back end. Uh, so if, if you have a VM that uh, really is closer to the way Pro 5 works, it's, it should be pretty, pretty easy. Uh, if you have a VM that, is, that, that has a, a mismatch, uh, then you have to hack, uh, add a lot of hacks. Yeah, I remember that. I think I was talking with you about it, Flavio, and someone else had brought up the same thing, that the first 90% of Perl that similar to JavaScript compiles to very fast JavaScript and then yes. it goes downhill rapidly from there. Yes, same problem with uh, if I wanted to compile to .NET or to JVM. Like now I'm implementing reference counting, I expect it to get really slow. I mean, like now it's about the same speed as Perl. Uh, it, uh, if I compile Perly to to Pro 5, it takes about uh, 11 seconds. Uh, compiling to JavaScript takes, uh, I mean, compiling inside Node takes about 10 seconds. So it's about the same. Uh, but I expect it to get like uh, maybe half the speed of Perl uh, when it's ready. Oh, your last sentence cut off there. You expect to get what now? Uh, I expect it to be maybe twice slower after implementing the, uh, all the memory man management. Okay. Like uh, reference counting and uh, so I can, yeah, also uh, uh, supporting tie and overload. So what is the path to um, merging Perlito and Perl 11? I think uh, uh, maybe an uh, AST to AST converter, because uh, I think uh, changing the uh, AST that Perlito generates uh, would, it doesn't, like uh, the AST is pretty close to the, to the syntax of Perl. I think it would make sense to make an, uh, Either an AST to AST converter, or uh, yeah, uh, converting to an intermediate language. But I think AST to AST is the easiest one, and that, that's mostly about uh, uh, getting the right semantics. Because uh, CDENT, uh, I understand, is a subset. Uh, uh, um. CDENT is meant to be a, um, a subset of, of object-oriented um, yeah. programming constructs and that are supported by at least 90% of the targeted VMs. I mean, you, you can write something in CDENT and during compilation it can say, oh, you've used something that doesn't, isn't supported by PHP. Mm -hmm. um, but for the yeah. most part, everything is, you know, should be supportable. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, I think uh, the the way I'm 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 trying now in uh, JavaScript is to create an object for, for example, a scalar. So uh, 
and this uh, in order to support reference counting. I think in uh, CDENT you basically need, need the same. One one thing that strikes me, and um, you might, I was wondering if we could team up and um, you could clone a repository and then bring it up on the screen since I don't have the my screen hooked to to the to the G plus hang up. Is that possible? Can I drop something in IRC and you? Yes. Bring it up. Okay. Um, one second then. Um, I think we'll start with. Give me a second. Oh, there it is. What I am going to do is um, flash through those slides real quick so at least they're recorded on this thing. And so that will be something I can do perhaps now. Um, what was that source command you did again? Source. What? That maybe. Okay, I'm gonna switch the. Um, I'm gonna switch back to screen sharing for just a minute and go back through, just flashing through those slides so that everyone can see. The that had here. Can you guys see the slides again now? I assume. Larry gave us advice. That was wonderful. Um, yeah. Background, Ingi is Superman. Uh, Jason, why? That was an interesting project. It was, it was a one day project that um, I'm going to show PegX in a second here, and that's what I want Flavio to help me show. But, um, you know, MST had this idea that he wanted Jason to be different. And I'm like, well, we can do that simply with a simple grammar, and, and we did it all in a day. Um, so keep going. I'm going to show PegX here in a minute. Web monkeys. I like anything that has the word monkey in it. So those are all the different um, PegX grammars that I'm working on, smaller and larger. Um, the first one being PegX parsing itself, which I'll just show in one second. Uh, a crusade, an acneist crusade to make everything work with everything else. Even crazier than what I'm trying to do. So CDENT is like Perlito that compiles. Um, I write a module once in the syntax of my choice and release it to CPAN and PyPy and, and NPM all at, all at once. And actually, PegX will be written in CDENT very soon. It's actually, we've started. We faked it by writing it in CoffeeScript, and it actually compiles to the NPM module that's on NPM now. Um, but we're going to keep refining that hackery until it actually replaces the CPAN module. As a compiled from coffee script dish thing. Keep going. That's that. And um, so Uniscript is is the dialect of CoffeeScript that supports um, the CDENT model, which means it supports Perl five and Perl six and Python. I happen to own Perl five i.org and Swarn didn't take it, and it was also the name of Damien's thing way back when. Um, but I'd like to apply it to something in this modern context. So um, in the airport today, I thought of Perl 11, which was 5 plus 6. And uh, yesterday, I started thinking that my way out of this, of getting everybody to start playing with these great new ideas, would be to have Perl 5 have pluggable VMs so that you can compile different syntaxes to different um, compilation units, whether they be native code or JVM or um, Perl bytecode or um, new stuff, and then have it required by the right VM and run in process with regular old CPAN code um, through a very tightly contracted dispatch unit. You know <laughs> I don't. I still don't know how this broadcasting thing works, so I'm gonna go. I think it's actually broadcasting what's on my uh, screen, which is not actually showing any of this stuff. Wait, hey. <laughs> All right. Somebody else hit record. <laughs> yeah, maybe they had. I'm just doing this for Nick. Yeah. I can, right. but I can talk this Nick through this in two seconds. So it's not really 
we're talking about combining abstract syntax um, between Perlito and Perl 11. That's kind of where we're at now. Is that Perl 11 is the idea that Perl 5 could have pluggable VMs such that um, they could be actual other Perl 5 VMs, or they could be Perl 6 VMs, or they could be the JVM or LLVM. Um, the idea that we start playing with other VMs, and it's not going to be a speed win, even if the VMs are super fast, because we have this slow um, dispatch thing to go through. But as we start playing with it, we can see the optimizations and see what the quick wins are and see um, that kind of thing, rather than just fretting about one direction or the other. Um, we play with all of them at once. That's the idea. And we get Perl 5 and Perl 6 actually running in the same processes and, and keep the uh, keep the, the love alive and keep the parrot love alive, which is something Rainy was kind of uh, worried about. This may be the most important slide on here, kind of showing what you're really trying to do overall. Yeah. yeah. And all this is a bunch of crack-fueled stuff I've came up with since yesterday, but um, it resonates in all of my years of knowledge and, and striving. So, I mean, I'm just surprised that they let you through the airport security with all the drugs that you must have had on you. <laughs> exactly. And your, and your fake made-up name. <laughs> at, least, at least I didn't have to cross uh, uh, international yeah, boundaries. Yeah, exactly. 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 Then you would have a yeah. strip search. That's a good point. Um, try before you buy, so we wouldn't have to make a whole bunch of changes to Pearl 4 for this particular thing. That's right. And then, um, oh, different syntaxes. Yeah, well, there's Perlito and Pearl 5i both right on there together. So I guess that kind of leads into what we've been talking about here. Oh, yeah, all the different violation units. And I think we can do all, we can actually get this bootstrapped in a slow way without making any core changes. I mean, we can just, using various um, PMC tricks and just coding, we can fake it until we make it. This is like one of your biggest ideas is the pluggable VM thing. That's kind of a central. That's what I, I'm calling Pro 11 is this pluggable VM. OK. So the, the basic idea of Pro 11 is to have pluggable VM. And then you're just adding that opcode was a, a maybe thing, but you're going to try and do as much as possible without doing that first. Oh, that was just uh, that was just yeah. Ignore that slide for the most part. Ignore that slide. Flavio, are you ready to take back over again? Uh, yes. Um, one second. Okay, should I uh, just make a quick presentation again? Yeah. Okay. I've got you on the thing that I think is what's recording, so in theory... I was hoping Flavio could um, show a few of my Git repos, which I would drop to him in IRC, he would clone, and then he could bring up the files and just talk about them real quick. Is that okay, Flavio? Yes, uh, do you want me to uh, uh, share the screen with a with, uh, uh, JSON PJX? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That'd be the place okay. to start. Okay. So um, this, this goes back to a Yapsy where I was introduced to Perl 6 rules by, um, by a guy named Patch. If you could just blow it up a couple. And so look at the um, the JSON PG that PGX file because this is the smallest. This is a very small tight grammar, and everybody knows JSON. Um, so, how many lines as long as that go to the bottom there? It's, like a, it's just two pages oh, long. Not 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 counting. Yeah. So at the top level, um, a JSON yes, document very small. is a map or a sequence. So. Um, PEGX has a clean separation of, of code and, and rules because it's intended to be run in any language immediately. So this would work in, um, in Node.js or any language where PEGX exists. And PEGX is just a really small runtime of about 300 lines of Perl. So all I need to do is port it, and this would work in a new language. Um, so we see that a map is 
um, curlies with maybe some white space on either side. So that, that tilde thing is, um, is a sigil for white space. Um, a lot of this was taken straight from Perl 6. Um, we, the, the percent sign is the list of things to the left separated by the, uh, the, the token on the right. And so you can see that a map is um, a left curly, some pairs separated by commas, and a right curly. And then a pair is a string followed um, by a colon followed by a node. And a node is a sequence, um, map sequencer scalar, which is YAML ease for hash array and scalar. Um, anyway, if you actually pull up json.pgx.yaml now, same file with a .yaml at the end. So when, when I make a change to the grammar, I just I say make here, and it, um, it compiles this to YAML, which can be loaded to native Perl. So I don't, at runtime, I don't have to parse this at all. Um, this is ready to go. And so all I have to do is apply this grammar data to an input stream of JSON and, and get a result. Now, if you, I'll give you another repo. Um, it's the same thing, except it's uh, ingi.net slash um, pegx dash JSON dash PGX. This is um, a Perl implementation of a JSON parser that uses this. Now, I want to point out the one thing is that, so I've written a complete programming language called TestML that's a test, a unit testing language that will run in any programming language. It Can you say it again? Oh, TestML, which is on CPAN as well. All of the tests for TestML are written in TestML and parsed by PEGX. And anyway, this yeah, whole test suite runs in sub-second. Yeah. Right oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can, you can. Oh, it would be TestML. Uh, that dash PM would probably be, but there's testML dash pegx and testML dash PM. I'm not sure what's it. Oh, test. Yeah. Um, th th this testML repository is, is is kind of out of date. You either want to get the grammar or the uh, Perl implementation, which would either be testML dash PM or testML dash PGX. Should I get in a sipon, maybe? Yeah, go ahead and. Let's look in sipon. Yeah, go ahead and, well, you can cpan install testml, which would get it three recs. And then. Which IRC channel are you on? One second. Which IRC channel are we on? Um, Perl.org. Um, pound Perl 11, Perl 11, Pound Perl 11. Dan Hartman, I'm surprised that I heard you at all. It was a very, very quiet um, noise from you, which is fine. I just want to let you know. Yeah, I turned my mic down a bit. Okay. So the idea of PEGX was to make something as simple as HTML um, so that people could actually like, if I have a if I have YAML parser described as PEGX, then when every any time somebody finds a bug in it, they can actually fix the bug, and it fixes the implementations in every language at once. Mm -hmm. um, That's pretty cool. And it's really um, they don't have to know. It. Yeah, it's completely language agnostic. Um, but the interesting thing was. All of the tokenization is done instead of character by character. It's done at the regex level. And these regexes combinate. If you looked at that YAML file, some of the regexes get um, quite large and unreadable as, as compiled regexes. But in the grammar themselves, they're very readable. And uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is this runs extremely fast, which was a pleasant surprise. And if I wanted to make it run extremely fast, I would write a lib pegex, but I don't need to yet. It all runs. Um, running the whole testML suite is less than a second, and it it does a ton of pegx compilation. Um, although I'm sure that the the grammars aren't quite as big as as the Perlito stuff yet. So I haven't tested it with really gigantic grammars yet. We'll see. Okay, which module do you want to show? 
Run the test suite to like prove. Ah, okay. LB, now I lost. Let me change screen. Anyway, one thing I was I wanted to see if you would want to entertain was um, possibly um, trying to get um, some of the Perlito stuff using the PegX grammars. That's where I kind of thought you were going with this, but I wasn't yeah. sure. They're making fun of your Romanian C pan mirror. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> they're jealous it's of it's going you. pretty far. Google Talk is using most of the CPU. <laughs> There's not much left. Yeah, that's true. Really? Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Oh. It's really slow. Maybe we can uh, get back to this later. Yeah. You know, anyway, I just wanted to, you know, maybe t um, take a look at some of the PGX grammars, including the, um, the one that parses PGX itself and uh, Hey, let, actually, instead of doing this, why don't you just actually show a couple of files in Vim? Or you could run. You mean in the in Cipan? Right, can you open up another terminal? Yeah, just yeah. Uh, in in the test ML library. I wanted to show the. Um... One second. What was that? Ah. If you look at um, lib test ML. That's uh, JSON PJX. Oh, no, no, the, um, the test ML. Yeah. I, I didn't, it didn't finish downloading yet. Oh, really? OK. Yes. Well, you can, you can actually show in the browser if you wanted to, I guess. Yeah, the browser is OK. Let me load it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, change into the browser. Yeah. One second. Okay. 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 If you look under um, grammar.pm. So I have a separate repo because I don't actually put the grammars in the in the Perl libraries because they're actually ACNIS. Um, they support many languages. But this, you can see, was compiled from dot dot um, testml pegx that file on my on my hard drive. Um, I ran a there, there, there's a, a built-in thing into the grammar where you you just load it from a one-liner and say um, load the module with a compile. Um, thing from the from a one-liner and it uh it'll recompile this from the source. But basically, this is the YAML file in in pure Perl. So when I load the grammar, it's already pre-compiled. And, and the regexes, if you go down a little bit, you'll see some of the massive regexes that were actually co combinated from um, 
smaller so like there's a regex for Assertion yeah not a regex that you'd want to de deparse in your head probably um, but really easy to 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 grok in the in the in the pegx grammar itself um, and so since it chunks these into large things it actually parses extremely fast I guess that's what I'm trying to say I'm sure it could be made faster but it's uh, quite quite zippy And that's because of the speed of the regular expression engine? Right so, right, so it goes back to this thing of if you can do a lot of work in one regex, then you only have to go across that C barrier wants to get there, right? So if you're going less calls across, if you're doing, you know, if you're matching little pieces of regex, it would be slower, but if you can combinate them into uh, bigger chunks. So it ends up that the grammars will combinate to the point where that they don't need to be performing callbacks for matches, that type of thing. And you combine them all into one gigantic form? Right, so that was the point. That's what Damien kind of tried to do, but it didn't really work out so great with um, regex grammars. Because he, you could, in Perl, you, supposedly you could call code from regexes. Whereas I have this runtime that's about 300 lines of Perl that will do the regexes and determine when it gets certain matches it calls back. So there's this concept of, and actually, could you go to it really quickly? There's a, if you back up, one yes it's called testimonial ast probably if you back up a screen so i have the concept yes. of a receiver class and in the receiver class you define what's called got methods with rule names and you don't actually have to have a got method for every rule match it's because um, there are implicit ones that will take the data and pass it up the tree and create an AST for you. The actual data that gets captured out of the grammar is wherever you put parens in the regexes inside the grammar. Those are the pieces of text that get put into an AST, and you define a got method when you need to reshape that part of the AST. So whenever you call a got method, it passes everything, it passes the tree below it, and then you reshape it and return it, and then that's the tree at that point. And then, you know, so when it, when it comes out, returning is what it thought the AST um, idea of this testimonial tree was. Now, the great thing about this, and going back to um, what we're talking about with Perlito, is that you can, apply, you can have one grammar, but multiple receiver classes. So you could have something that did straight source, uh, like say, yeah, say you wanted to use the same parser to create five different um, back-end modules, one being source code, one being J JVM type of AST, one being a um, Perl access code, that kind of thing. You can just um, plug in a different receiver class for each one without changing the grammar at all. And then this would work in, in, in every language. So the, the, I guess the part that you do actually have to port when you go to different languages is this receiver class. So if I wanted to run this all in Python, I have to report. That. But once cdent exists, then I write the receiver class in cdent, and then it automatically just ports to everything at once. So I only oh, have to write yeah. that as once, too. So this all kind of thing ties together. You're going to write cdent using cdent? Of course. Yeah. yeah. You, you could use a time machine to achieve that. <laughs> Who was it? Dave Mitchell said to use a time machine? Or maybe I thought that was Adam. chromatic. Yeah. Was yeah. Anyway, that's all. I just it's, we that, we can we don't have to go any further on this F block. I just want to make you aware of kind of like um of this and and have you start thinking about if we could because I don't have anything the size of um like a Perl grammar in PegX yet. Like a full, I mean, TestML is probably the biggest language that I've implemented. Um, the JSON and the JSONy ones. I wanted to show the JSON receiver class because that's actually like just 25 lines long. It's so minimal, and the JSONy one is only a couple lines longer. But anyway, we don't. We don't. This isn't gonna. This doesn't really play into. I just wanted you to be aware of of this because I thought it
you'd be interested in it. Something not working. Is your is your machine crashing? Okay. Uh, I'm trying to understand here. Uh, it it didn't install from C1. All we see is you looking at your web browser. Ah. Okay, um, let me go back here. Uh, I'm trying to finish the installation. Okay, I'm trying to finish the TestML installation. That's why it took so long to install Room before. Oh, because I have Okay, I think I have it. Now I can show. Just a minute. Second. This is really slow. Okay. Share. Maybe I'll have to give a talk. How Google Plus killed the Inge? One demo. Inge? Yeah. This is now, uh, I think, the testimonial. Uh, Directory. Should I uh, right make? I just say prove my prove minus LVT or time prove minus LVT or prove minus okay. B well, minus L. Time will be. C can you see the screen? No, uh, really. it's well kind of. The yeah. fonts haven't resolved really. It's like for some reason. Let me increase it. No, it's just it's it's, it's our uh, codec for some reason is not uh, refining on one. It's showing up fine over here actually. If you want to. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. I see. It's it's just on the big screen for us for some weird reason, but we can see just fine on the small screen. Here. Oh, space T, right? There are some problems. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, Yeah. Uh. Let's, let's hey, uh, let's let's chat up on on IRC later tomorrow at at bar. We, we we can we can work on this tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. On IRC. What what should we do next? Um. Does anybody else? I was going to talk for a minute, but does anybody else have anything that they want to talk about? Rainy? I think we should have. Like, what about the other people? Are there like any like uh, I think ideas that we or did questions? Have, um, uh, bulk bulk eighty eight. Are you here? Can I come? Daniel Dragon. I saw him join. Uh, Dana, do you have any input? I don't know where I don't know where uh, bulk 
KBA card. I did see him join it at one point. Um, I did want to do something, which I'll experiment with here briefly, seeing if the whiteboard will show up. Using the <clears throat> hey, you can see that circle. Yeah. Um, I was just going to write a few things on the board here and see if that was a uh, it meant anything at all. Um, so, I guess there's three parts that is not even, I don't, I can't tell if you guys can read that or not, but it says parts, and then, uh, um, the, then there was run at the end which is also apparently not particularly visible here. But what I'll do is I'll try and make these more visible, at least as, as objects on the board. And then I, I never really fully grasped what the middle step was. Um, but what I did kind of get was that the, the parser was the part that if you if you tried to modify the parser, then you're doing the guts approach. If you try and make your own parser, then you're doing the non-guts approach. And I'm not sure if I'm right about that. And also, I'm not maybe I'm not totally understanding what the intermediate, like Perl code grapher, abstract op tree, or whatever the middle step was, but it was like parsing the code into something, doing something with that maybe, and then running that something. Right. What am I what am I not getting? I'm trying to well, make this goo goo gaga simple talk with three circles. And then what I was trying to do from here was to figure out is my is my idea of what's guts and what's non guts correct or am I just totally misreading yeah, yeah. this? So I'm not a guts person. I'm not a I've done very little um, internals work, but I, I have actually done a little bit. But anyway, let me, let me give a real high level view that uh, Rainy can be disgusted with. So, <laughs> Rainy's they, already disgusted with us. Per, Perl is this big glob, um, and the Perl language is the Perl language. I mean, it defines the Perl language. It's not written from spec or anything like that. Um, and it takes um, an input stream basically converts it to bytecode, and then it has um, something that runs those bytecodes or opcodes, as it were. Um, but it does, as it's parsing, it's actually running code that can affect the parse and whatnot. So it's all just one big mess um, that does what it does. And we need to chop it apart. Well, to, to a degree, and to agree, it, it's been done and undone. So there's the um, the idea is that when you parse Perl, it's just in memory. Now, what the Perl CC project um, aimed to do was, and it has to be in memory because you're actually running it as you're as you're parsing it and that kind of thing. But um, the Perl CC decided that hey, we can take the normal case of this and actually create a serialization of it that can then be loaded as a pre-compiled unit. So we can actually compile this thing and load it in and unless it's doing certain things. And I think that bad got, things. That got taken out at like five point eight was the 5, last 10. version. Well five ten had it still, right? No, it was 
5.10. It works on every version. It was it was it core was, for a while. Yeah, and then I mean, it was core. And then they Five, pulled six, it from five, core. So I, I actually had to downgrade my Perl because I was using that bytecode compiler for quite some time. And I, and I had to significantly change a lot of code to make it compile. But I did. I got a huge amount of Perl code to successfully compile and run by doing a lot of modification and init blocks and stuff. So here, here's the run loop, and here's the, the parsing loop, and then somewhere in the middle is what we call the opcode tree. Op right? tree, okay. So we have the op tree, as it were. And I just think of this as um, bytecode, blob, or AST. It's all the same to me. Yeah. Um, Perl code graph, somebody called it that on Perl monks. They made that up. AST, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And with, with Perl CC, you could actually um, pre-compile modules out here yeah. and then load them in, and then they should work the same. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is it's that you could a dump here. You pause it, yes, and it's dumped here, and then it's loaded again here. That's right. And so what I'm saying is you could get, um, if you used a different run loop, because this all this stuff is very tightly tied together and breaks every rule, as Rainy say. As no, oh, oh. no, this this is pretty hairy stuff. Yeah. This is okay, normal hairy, and this this is super easy. Okay, so it's really easy to change the button. Right, and so if you abstract and think of this as the Perl five VM, then um, right. it's possible, yeah. although you know unproven, also if it's compiled on VM. Right, that there's can be other. VMs because you know there's a lot of okay. VMs out in the world right now. There's the JVM, very solid and does what it does. There's the Parrot VM, which is a lot of Perl six is betting on, and and, and so forth. And um, and so if you had units like this, that could that could be loaded in such that they were in a like you had some source spot. You, 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 you still say we're still starting with Perl. If you could somehow compile Perl into a JVM unit, then when that got in, you could say, okay, run this bit in the JVM, and when you call between the two, do some hand waving. Which we won't talk about. Way. Yeah, we won't talk about the hand waving just this and that. Um, and these could all be in PMCs with a header saying, this is intended for the JVM. But then there could also be a unit of, like, if there's two different versions of JVM, the process loading this code, they oh use this in this JVM rather than this JVM. So, um, which I think is interesting because as you start seeing this as an abstraction of a per of the actual Perl op tree as it exists now, there's the potential to run it under different Perl VMs or possibly. Anyway, easy with with, with your ass to open up your ass. Right. That's a little bit harder for and, the then, and then the final thing that coffee proves is that this, once you have that, then the <laughs> sources can be anything beautiful that you want. Now, a lot of people think Perl is very beautiful. Um, I think, think non-magic Perl, Perl is beautiful. I don't right. let them use magic in the code they write for me, usually. And I, I've been doing as much JavaScript as Perl in the last five years. And um, CoffeeScript is a syntax. It, it, it's so much more better. It's just hands down better, just as a syntax, the whole tool chain doesn't add up to being perfect yet. But I think that it will. So anyway, you can have different <coughs> abstractions of, of source code, um, different abstractions of these things. And these things can be actually applied to, not every one of these can be applied to every VM, but certain ones can be applied to more than one VM. And that's about all I have. So <coughs> right. no, that's about the same idea and what he has said. So, for this, you need a good parser, which emits a, a readable AST, which can emit other codes, either binary codes, which would be normally a class file, or a PVC file, or a PMC file, in our case. And the PMC file could be any of those. Because PMCs are already loaded by Perl. That's right. Yeah. And a PMC is no different than a PM. So you can actually write the compiled unit to VMs. Yeah. It's only if you want to just have the input sitting next to the compilation thing. It's just a trick, really. PMC yeah. is what's output by the bytecode compiler? You know, everybody can write a PMC. PMC. 
Uh, it's just when it, it, it wire does when it looks for a module, it looks for that PMC first and then for that PM. Okay. It must be valid Perl code, but usually, for example, with the byte code compiler, it has used byte loader here, and the rest is binary. So byte loader reads, uh, loads the filter module, yeah. and interprets the rest as binary. Right. And the same exactly. could be with, with PVC, would be like parrot loader or something. And you could even have a PMC that says, I'll look for a PMD first, or yeah, you know what I mean, if you wanted to. So, so you have all kinds of tricks that you can play. Any Perl level. here, and the rest could be any binary. It could be a class file, it could be anything. And even if PMC didn't exist, what I'm saying is you could just use PM yeah. files if you had a different. And here you can have any source. If you have a source compiler, for example, if you see that at Berlito, uh, this kind of, kind of parses you can, even with 90%, uh, you can cross pass to, to other stuff. The hardest part, I think, is the, the XS part. Mm -hmm. How to interface with XS? A lot of people want to say, oh, don't support XS at all. And then that's just like, yeah. well, fine, then why do you, you're not going to support CPAN? XS has problems. X XS has, uh, I don't like really XS. Well, Pro 5 has problems, but we're trying <laughs> to get past that. <laughs> So I could imagine easy languages like inline or, or a, a, an easier interface for accessing Perl functions. Inline, for example, is the best example. But uh, there are also other ways directly link the functions here because our ops here are super abstract. In, in difference, the prepared um, the, the prepared ops are super typed. So in parrot. Every op has a type suffix. That means integer number. Yeah. And ours take no arguments at all. They take the arguments dynamically from somewhere. From an, an, an stack That's right. somewhere. So, so either you can have it completely untyped or completely typed, and those are even in registers. Um, and with JVM, it's also JVM is also JVM is a little bit different. It's, it has a lot of typed ops and a lot of untyped ops. So you have to translate the, the binary representation, you can translate the source translation, but it's pretty, the easiest is to, to, to switch uh, the run loop. We have alternative run loops on CPAN. There's the normal run loop, the debugging run loop, there's the JIT run loop, which I, I'm trying. There's a, a switch run loop, which, which is one, not running in a while loop, it's just running in a switch loop. So the switch one loops. The problem is how uh, what to do in the one loop because you got either this one or you got this one, and then you need for those you need a translator, which is like okay, so this is basically a translator. But if you use if you for example want to load PVCs, which are parent, uh, pre compiled crazy VM functions, then you can then call out the parent. But the problem is that the data, how to read and write to original data. Because the op tree is only what you see with econ size, you've already noticed. But this is only the behavior. You, you also got the data, SV, AV, and so on. So you have the, the ops, which is the op tree, and on the stack you have those data and you and the problem is it would be pretty easy to translate ops, but it would be not so easy to translate data also with external VMs. That's the hard part. So so uh, Inge came up with the idea: don't cross data. Do it with with simple functional interface. Don't share data. Um, if we need to pass data back and forth, call it uh, just not use a normal functional. So you put it into arguments and get something back as return types, like a messaging interface. Like, like, like this one. Maybe not quite, because what do you do when um, when one VM does callbacks into another VM? You know, I think they, I think that the the calling interface manages the stack. The way I would do it. That's like a call stack. Okay, yeah, shared, a shared call stack. A shared call stack. Yeah. Okay. Which is that's pretty hard. Which is really gross. Yeah. <laughs> And probably inefficient, but it, it gets us there cleanly, and then we start looking about how to make it. Um, the problem is, you need types. <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah. So, the, like, 
the sea dance <laughs> stuff. Everything with <laughs> rainy comes back to adding. No, he's absolutely right. Ask so, Larry. It's, you can't interface with Java or with any other language without types or even JSON. JSON needs is it an int, is it a num, is it a string. So you need to declare it somehow. So even when you pass a callback into the JVM, it has to know the type of callback. No, I, 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 I have completely have agree. I don't things. even think it's funny. I mean, it's like, you're right on. I don't know why you're laughing. Probably because you've been beaten up. Yeah, because so everybody says, ah, oh, no, types, you don't, you don't want to hear about it. But it's, it's, it's because it's, everyone who's complained to me about Rainy complains about but, that but, specific but here, thing. But here's the thing. You don't because need to introduce types. Stupid. <laughs> you don't need to introduce types into the source code. You don't need no. to make the source code ugly no. to get typing. No. You just need it. You have all kinds of tricks at your disposal. You only need it for JSON or, or for external modules. When you call other. When One of the problems that a CDent module has is that it really can't make use of other modules because if I try to make use of LWP, for my dis that doesn't exist on some other language. So what I can, but what I can do is provide a little type map interface that maps to LWP and Perl and something else in Python so that it's. It, fulfills the same contract, and then I can call native stuff in Python and Perl and Ruby um, from a CDent module, as long as I support that type contract. And I think that's kind of a concept that would need yeah. to be here. It's only for the interface, only for cross-language interface. Basically. Yeah. But these kind of stuff, so I'd need it for static compilation, but it's only for optimizing and over computing for the environment to enjoy. And and for Moose, it would be good because Moose already uses it, and it would be pretty easy to optimize on types with Moose. Now, the reason why I wanted to draw this particular drawing with these three parts was because I did get some general consensus that these three parts are the three parts. So that was something that, like, nobody strongly disagreed with. You know, and considering all the other disagreement, I was trying to grasp to whatever I could that everyone sort of agreed to. And then from there, I, I wanted to, I'm going to re-ask now, I'm, I'm asking everybody, and Flavio, you too, you know, mm -hmm. is this parsing thing really the real pearl guts? Is this one part more important than these three as far as defining what's a guts approach and what's a non-guts approach? Because the reason why I asked that is that people were people are saying Perl defines Perl, and the parser is that definition of Perl defining Perl. I think they're both right. Here's what here's what I think. This um, this is the only parser that will ever parse into an AST in memory, but the other parsers can parse stuff into ASTs that live on disk and can get loaded by a simple mechanism. So we leave Perl alone. In that sense, Perl the parser part of Perl. Here, Perl the parser. All, actually, all these three things remain the same, but we built uh, things around that that allow us to try other things. And as we get gravitational shifts towards them, maybe they start moving in after we're sure that it's the right thing to do. Right. Okay. So we get we get to play with um. Yeah. Different. Yeah. You technologies. couldn't. You couldn't. You can create a complete. You can create a better est with a better parser or a different parser to the same VM, for example. Or you can create, uh, you can use the same parser with the same optree and then translate this to a different language, for example. Right. So back to the two different approaches. But with I think oh. I think in terms, sorry, I, th I think in okay. terms of guts, uh, basically you are talking about uh, Perl original source code in C. That that's good for me because parser, like Perlito, can parse also. Yeah, when I when I say these three things that I drew up on the board, this is all referring to to the original Perl stuff written in C. Yeah, but they, they like Perlito also has all the steps. So, it, I think when you say guts, it's about the Perl uh, the C code. It is, and so to be to be very more specific, even. Perlito and Cdent are the two main um, incarnations of the non-guts approach, using my terminology, which may be flawed. And then Rainey's kind of idea of um, 
changing parts of the core would be the guts approach. Right. Yeah, I would. I mean, yeah, I really think so. Pegex don't compare exactly, but they overlap in sections. Well, and that's why I'm that's why I'm actually bringing this up yeah. and perhaps belaboring it because what I'm trying to do is figure out in my mind what is the actual real definition of these two approaches. Are they two separate approaches, which I think they are? And if so, what I had written and what I wrote on Pearl Monks was that I thought that this was the most important part out of these three when it comes to the differences in these two approaches. That, that the leaving this alone, but, um, or rather, the, the approach of using this, even if this all changes, if you use this at all, it's the guts approach. If you write your own parser, it's the non-guts approach. I think that you really need to write your own parser because the only output of that parser is that circle below it. And so you really can't play any games without going through the P5P. I mean, that's very P5P owns that top circle. You know, and it's, it has to be. It has well, to be protected. Well, then you're right. But then we get back to the Perl defines Perl thing. And if, and well, you're arguing for the non-guts approach. Duh. Yes, you should be. That's you the approach that you're arguing for. And, and what I'm saying is um, nobody seems convinced that any approach 100% is for sure going to work right. So fine work. I know. I think you want a faster Super freaking fast. Yeah, so I'm not even interested in that yet. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll, I'll get you there. Uh, OK, well, but the point is that there um, I may be wrong, but I'm still trying to clarify. Um, is the use of the original Perl parser the, the, the main divergence between these two approaches, or is there something else that I'm not getting? All three parts. It, the parser is pretty simple, actually. It's the, the problem is how does the S look like, because this is optimizable, and how yeah. does the VM look like? <laughs> this is just hard to hack. But it's pretty easy. In, with the Perl parser, is super hard to hack. But, so it could be replaced by other stuff. But it doesn't affect uh, startup time or runtime efficiency at all. Uh, efficiency is done here with pre-compilation, or here at runtime. And actually, I think that a lot of what I'm getting at is um, has to do with backwards compatibility, because um, I don't think that it's appropriate to break anybody's code ever, um, especially because of CPAN. CPAN is why everybody's still using Perl 5 instead of Perl 6, um, from my personal opinion, at least. Well, Flavio and Audrey, I think, really got that. I mean, and that Pugs was very committed to running all of CPAN, right, Flavio? Uh, yes, uh, but that was uh, uh, by embedding uh, Perl 5. And uh, the plan was to actually uh, bootstrap uh, Pugs later uh, in Pro 5, which uh, was why I started the, mini, the bootstrap, yes, the Mini Pro 6. But uh, yeah, it, it was never meant to abandon Pro 5. Yeah, and I think that needs to, I'd like to see that. Well, so my concern was that we can do we can do approaches that are not 100% backwards compatible, and that's fine, because there's going to be a lot of people that can use that. But we have to have another approach that is, it never diverges from 100% compatibility. Like every step of the way, it keeps 100% compatibility. Um, because, you know, for me personally, my code, you know, probably relies on thousands of CPAN modules, and I don't even know which ones they are. Because there's so dang many of them. They all have so many requirements. And so, you know, for all intents and purposes, my code could use all the CPAN modules. And I don't want to break my own code from a selfish point of view. So that's, and nobody else wants their code to break because they're all using a thousand CPAN modules too with a million dependencies. So that's why I keep going back to this parser thing. If this, if this, parser right now is the only parser that gives us 100% compatibility, and I don't mean 99.95, it has to be 100%. This is, Perl 
the Perl parser defines Perl. And so if this is the only thing that gives us 100% compatibility, then that's what makes it more important in my mind than these two <laughs> other things. I have seen Perl. This is also Perl. And this is also Perl. Okay. So there is stuff embedded in here that fulfills the Perl defines Perl Everything. thing as well. Especially because Perl is not dynamic. Especially a lot of decisions are left over to the contract. And I also suspected that as well. So, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the whole point of this is to prove me wrong and to make me rethink my own, at least, theoretical approach to how this, or conceptual approach to how this works, that the Perl 5 parser that exists now in the Perl core is not particularly more special than the other two parts, as far as the Perl defines Perl. Just thing. the most crazy part. But the compiler is also pretty crazy. Uh, I would never write the compiler like this. I, maybe I would write the parser like this, and uh, for sure I would write the... the the VM, the run loop like this. So the run loop is fine, you think? It's it's not fine. It's not optimizable at all. Oh, okay. Because it's it got this crazy ABI or uh, <coughs> how how functions are called by taking arguments from the heap. So so normally a function takes arguments locally from stack. So it has to access every argument somewhere. So it's 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 not easy cacheable. The, the op tree, it's not linear. It's basic blocks, so it's, it has to jump around, so it's not, opti not really optimized here. So, so let's, let's go back and correct my incorrect perceptions that all three parts are Perl defining Perl, and all three parts are equally critical to the 100% compatibility. Is that what you're telling me? And all parts are optimizable. Pretty they need to be optimized. Okay, but the compatibility, the, the compatibility. Yeah, it's they can All be optimized parts. fully compatible and it's quite pretty easy to uh, to make them better with, with keeping backwards compatibility. Okay. So then so now my mind is just my ideas are evolving and I'm talking uh, just off the cuff here, but what I'm what I'm giving in my mind then is that there are still two approaches and both approaches, in a way, need to eventually replace all three parts. And that the guts approach, um, what I'm still going to call the guts approach, basically starts with what exists and kind of moves from the inside out and tries to replace stuff using the existing code. And then sort of the non-guts approach is starting with with stuff outside of that and working from the outside in. Is that totally off base or are those kind of two different approaches? Nobody really cares what happens here and here. Everybody cares what's put in and what's out. So you can replace everything with Perl 6, with just parts of Perl 5 and omit the same stuff. Okay. Well, <laughs> it needs to read libraries. As long as you can run out the libraries. Yeah. Well, excess. excess. Yeah, excess. Yeah, CPAN is excess as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah. Supporting yeah. CPAN and compatibility means supporting excess. I think of replacing excess with some uh, source compatible syntax. So, because excess is mainly uh, macro definitions, C macros, which could be easily replaced. But that's another project for the next five years. Yeah, but we can't expect people to rewrite their code. No, no. You're talking about just translating automated translation sometimes? No, uh, uh, source level. Okay. Push P or push, push S would be the same, but it would internally would be something completely different. Op. Op takes an argument from the stack. It's not, it's not defined where, it's just a magic stack somewhere. And nobody cares where it is. Eventually you can apply some pragma that applies a different com cursor compiler to existing CPAN modules um, where it can produce, and, and then every tenth one it'll say, oh, this doesn't parse, and then either use a different module or fix the problem, right? Yeah. I mean, when you get, that's the hope. That point. You're yeah. talking about rewriting code again, though. No, no, no. Well, 
you know, one, once you, it's, it's all about a journey, right? Mm -hmm. Once, um, there'll always be stragglers that need a little rewriting, a little bit. Right, so. But so you want to get to a point where maybe 90% don't, and then the rest just get left behind, or they just, you know. And, and I, and work. actually, it's, what you're saying is what I see to be the primary difference between these two approaches, that in one of them, we're moving towards 100%, compatibility, but maybe we only get to 95, and that's fine, because like you said, after a few years, those 5% will either upgrade or die. That's, that is one approach. The other approach I see is we never leave the 100% compatibility arena, and we just work within retaining 100%. So maybe that's actually the more appropriate distinction between the two approaches. One of them is moving towards 100%, one of them is staying at 100% compatibility. And, 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 I, and I see the moving towards 100% method as the one that may, that allows us more creativity and allows us perhaps more optimization, whereas the one where we stay at 100%, we're working within maybe more confines of weird magic, and it's just harder to get the optimizations. These are just feelings I have. So I don't know how apropos this is, but it's just the... Uh... Can I go down a thought pattern right here for a second? So one thing I was thinking of is, um, you know, it's like kind of a sex thing, like top or bottom. But uh, <laughs> like decide. But in, in this decide. Okay, in, in this situation, um, Pearl, Pearl 5 is topping the other VMs. It's the entry point anyway. So, um, but that is just kind of an implementation detail. Let's say that you wanted to run a Perl 6 program that called all of CPAN, or called different modules from CPAN. One way to do that is to have something that starts Perl 5, but knows about uh, the Perl 6 start thing, which is compiled down here, loads that up and immediately goes over to the parent runtime, which goes along until it needs a Perl 5 module. Now it's just done one pass, actually through the call, the shared call stack, and now it's over in the parrot, and it might stay there forever, but now it's like, oh, now I need to call LWP. And so um, now, LW, is LWP written in XS? I don't know. No, no. So let's say it wants to call YAML XS. Yeah, YAML XS. Okay, so um, as long as it has a tight functional call to that, it doesn't matter that that's in excess. It can call YAML or YAML excess as long as the function that it's calling it knows um, the input types, that both sides know the input types and the return type. Then it, once you're over into this, um, you just jump in. Yeah, once you're into this run loop, then the modules that you're calling can be access modules. Now you're still talking about that's the the, the multi VM thing. The pluggable so still the track ends. Yeah, it's still the transition thing. But eventually people will be like, ah, oh, this JVM stuff, it's great that we have it, but we never use it. And it's like what we really always use is Parrot and this. Let's figure out how to converge them. Now we have all this information of how to just make it happen. Just yeah. to make people happy. That's one point. <laughs> <laughs> Adding NQP to the is list. Is NQP a, a VM? I, yeah. I it's, it's also a syntax, right? They try to be a uh, VM. They're writing their, their own library on top of it. It's their own parser. So it's, it's, it's a parser. Thing. It's all three levels. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's not really the VM because it's it's still taking memory and and, and function calling from Parrot, but for the rest is containing so to so in, in, that, in that case I mean you're actually even though this is a Perl 5 thing you're 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 actually the, the end user is doing Perl 6 that has done these hoops to make it actually fall into Perl 5 <laughs> so I think it's a way to for the Perl 6 people to actually get back into CPAN but again they need this type I, I believe currently they're going to need to know the types of the things they're calling. 
and how do we add that in? With, you said there were tricks to add that in without making changes to the core. No, I... it's, it's easy from Perl 6 to Perl 5 because it's easy to call from a better language to an untyped language. The problem is to call from Perl into other languages because um, Perl doesn't know the types. In Perl, it's multi. It's like, Perl is like Visual Basic. Now, even Visual Basic is better. Uh, Perl is... Oh. Yeah, it's, it's much better. <laughs> Uh, 50 lashes with a... No, it's in, in Perl, it can be any of those. It, it entirely depends on the context and on the op, but you pass only the data, not the op. So nobody knows about what it could be. So modules make assumptions about it. So JSON thinks, oh, looks like a string, but it could also be a number, so let's try. Oh, no. It's not a number, it's just things and so on. Oh, it looks like UTF-8. Oh, it could be UTF-8. No, is it UTF-8 and so on? So it, it does its own, it, it has to waste a lot of time and memory just to get the type of it. And in Parrot, for example, or in Perl 5, the string even has the encoding in it. So we know if it's UTF-8 or UTF-16 or anything. And, and the number it's known, and, and also the, is it a double or non-double, or so the exact word representation is, is stored. And, and with Java, you get the, the length of integers. So it's a in four, if eight, or a couple like this, I can see. So you have better type information. Uh, the only good thing is objects. And that's why that's really easy. But the core type, not known. Flavio, did you want a chance to say anything? Um, yeah, well, I agree that the only way to get 100% is to use the current compiler. Uh, like Perlito could uh, parse excess uh, uh, and try to emulate it, but it, like, you really need uh, maybe a, a and uh, like you need to write a new VM uh, specifically for that. I think, I, like, I just don't don't see. Uh, I like the idea of uh, uh, using types that uh, Rani suggested a few times, uh, because th then you can uh, generate fast code. But I don't see how to get uh, fast uh, running Perl five uh, without m modifying programs a bit. Except um, maybe th there there is this idea of uh, changing the the way Pro Five works inside the guts. Uh, that's I think is the safest uh, way to to go. Uh, I, I can see how uh, Perlito could generate uh, could be more flexible and uh, can allow a lot of research to be done. But uh, in, in the short term, like uh, one year, uh, I don't see it happening. There is, uh, on that note, there is um, one, one of the approaches that the one that Yuval is in favor of is taking all the PP code and replacing it yeah. with, yeah. So what I, in, in, in my model, in the Perl 11 model, what you do is you have the old run loop written in C, and the new <laughs> run loop written in LLVM, and then you have a require that can say, you know, like require LL or something like that. And then you start with that, so you start seeing, so you don't have to change any source codes, but you, you run them under different things. And then if it's just the case that LLVM is always the same as the run loop, 100%, um, then you just throw away the old run loop at that point. Um, but you can still start playing with the two different run loops without um, needing any buy-in from anybody else, right? You know, you bought to do this whole thing and just start playing with it. This is already fastest. You can't get faster than our current run loop itself. Yeah, so if you, even if you compile it in LLVM, it's, it will be the same speed or slower than our current run loop. The problem is that the layout of this op tree here you could optimize the optree and then use an um, optimized or, or better information from the optree for the run loop. 
That's and then you would need a new run loop for that as well to utilize the better information uh, or upgrade the existing. The ideas uh, optimize. Uh, the I see. So forget the LLVM thing. Just, yeah. Just one second. I think and then I'll be done. Yes. Um, my my point is that if you want to do major modifications to the run loop, do them in parallel using the the pluggable run loop to start with. And then, and then see how it all plays out. Because it, it might be that, like, oh, the 20% of the modules still need the old run loop, right? They just don't work under the new run loop. And then slowly, you get to where you want, and then the old run loop just falls away like a dead scab. I like to think of code that way. It's like, when it's no longer run, it just flakes away, and you've never even thought about it. Anyway, go ahead, Flavio. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with uh, what you say. I think it's because th then you can, uh, if, you, if your module doesn't run in the new uh, run loop, you just use the old one. Yeah. So uh, you just use, you just migrate wh whatever works and keep the, the everything else in uh, plain pro. There, there, I mean, the problem that you're ignoring and that I'm ignoring is that um, when you run some code in one run loop and the other and they call between each other, they have to go through the uh, a horrible, um, horribly clean call stack, shared call stack thing. But that's, you know, so what? You just do it and then you make it better, you know, that's what, why we have great programmers like Raffle. He's like, okay, you guys tried. You know, I'll fix it. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so to, I'm, I'm gonna restate some stuff to make sure I understand what we're saying that um, all three parts, the parts of the compiler and the virtual machine that exist the, in C, written for Perl 5 right now, uh, they all have to be kept to keep 100% compatibility. And what we can do is, um, at least for runtime performance, we can improve on the compiler and the VM side of things, um, and, and, and even potentially have the shared call stack hypervisor type thing that will allow the pluggable backends and have more than one VM going at a time um, and and use that to retain 100% compatibility forever. Um, I'm still going to call that the guts approach and I'm still seeing that as different from the working towards 100% compatibility thing that we would get through a Perlito or Perl 11 thing. And I know that I'm I am restating things multiple times because I'm still not clear in my mind. Is what I just said correct or not? So, there's one other concern, um, and given what we what, uh, what we were just talking about, is that you have, where exactly do you declare um, which run loop the module gets run by? Is it is it the the person loading the module says oh Try this in the in the new run loop. Because at some point you're going to have to change code, and that can get ugly because modules use other modules and whatnot. Or is it in the anyway? That has to be figured out, and I'm not sure that there's. Um, I don't off the top of my head know the clean way to do that. Well, you could the the people that would be front runners could give an explicit thing that says I have tested this and it works in the new run loop. Right. You could have a manifest that just said these popular modules. Work. If you see one of these popular modules, run it in a new loop because it's way better. But you can do it. Yeah, go ahead. You can do it in the module. Uh, we do this in, in a v6 pm. Okay, if you well, use uh, if you use v6 uh, pm, it will just run in a completely different way. You know what v6 pm is? Uh, oh. No. I don't know. Uh, that's a um, uh, uh, Pro six to Pro five compiler, and you in the beginning of the module you you say uh, use v six uh, minus something, and then it will the rest of the module is Pro six, and uh, basically the, the v six pm module takes care of compiling and uh, running whatever needs to be run. So I think uh, 
if we, we just use uh, like create a Pro5 module and use Pro5 uh, minus uh, JVM, uh, you can hack uh, the, the the adapter there. Yeah, and I, I think also there should be the ability to, to override that saying require J, require JVM on something that wants to use another. Yeah. Device. Yeah, there should be some kind of negotiation, but yeah. Then you you just have another level of um, of VM dependency, I guess. Maybe kind of sort of like a, a yeah. parallel dependency between. We already know that these modules are dependent on other modules. Now add a meta layer of what modules are dependent on which VMs and match exactly. that as well. Exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Flavio, but these probably should, for starters, just be shipped as modules, right? So we can use the CPAN prereq infrastructure. Sorry, what do you mean? Oh, if we want something that depends on the JVM, that it just declares that as a, it's actually installed as a module. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, so you can use the existing dependency structure right. to yes. make VM dependency. Right. That this distro requires these pluggable VMs. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we still have two different approaches, um, even though it's slightly different than what I had thought it was before. Um, we're still seeing enough overlap between Perlito and Perl 11 to merge those projects. Is that correct? Um, Sorry, can, can, you, can you say it again? Are we, are we still seeing enough similarity between Perlito and Perl 11 to have those two projects merge as the primary non-guts approach? I think Perl 11 is an umbrella project to um, get code running in under Perl 500 different VMs. It's a VM. And I think that we would need something like I think just using Perlito straight out of the box would be um, a way to start doing that, to have this compiled to, we probably want it to compile to some kind of, um, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Perl 11 yes, is, oh, just make it compile to a PMC, it doesn't matter what that PMC looks like, just to kind of. Yeah, uh, Perlito is just a compiler, it doesn't specify where it runs, so I think, yeah. I think it can be used as a library, if necessary. Yeah, so Rainy just added those three things to the top there. Those are the three parsers that we have. To, that's great. We have, have our original Per5 parser, we have Perlito, 99%. Per5 grammar in production right now, and Pegex, I don't know how far it is. Pegex, maybe even less than this one. Oh. And what about Larry's new one that he's Pegex working is on? a parsing. Framework. Yeah, but, but so you, we, a Perl, you need to implement the. I would call that Perl 5i is the yeah. syntax that we want. Okay, yeah, that, that's a better build. Yeah. Well, uh, Pegex is the parser, Perl 5i. Well, I guess Perl 5i would be the parser. Yeah, just right. Perl 5i. Ah, that's a bit of a Oh, right, with modules, yeah, it was more. Yeah. It depends on my more Damien's vision of the Perl 5 call and stuff. Okay, so. so Oh, that's more the engine. But you also have different, you have other parses also. You have MAPA. But, but you can also say there, you can say um, Uniscript, which isn't, doesn't look like, no, but it, it compiles to a, it definitely compiles to an AST that's loadable. Okay. Um, how do we get. Like I'll be, I'll be definitely writing all my Perl modules in Uniscript within a year. How do we get? Um, I'm not sure which year, but within a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only it weren't so sad, it would be hilarious. Um, how do we get? Um, how do we get Larry's blessing on this? We have it. We have it. Yeah. To I mean, what Larry's, degree? Larry's, you know, Larry said it had the appropriate degree. 
Um, is that the same thing as I'll, I'll I approve I'll, I'll what you're doing? I, I, I called Larry today just to talk to this crazy guy who had no idea what he what he was getting himself into. Um, was calling together some girl people to meet in Texas and talk about making girl faster. And uh, then I told him about some crazy ideas that I had about maybe using separate um, interpreters in the same process. And uh, and then I was and I told him I really wasn't sure what was the going to be the resulting goal. And Larry just said, um, "Have the appropriate amount of fun." So, and uh, F. Glock says, "Larry says all is fair if you pre-declare." <laughs> and so let's just pre-declare that uh, that we want Larry. Yeah, that, that's the idea of the uh, use uh, VM JVM, for example. Like if you Larry is very uh, Larry is very accepting of um, of ideas and things. I, I mean, don't I don't want just acceptance. I want like endorsement so that it won't be a political problem of you're not official. The Pearl Five Quarters don't. It might be harder doing. Yeah. I... Well, you know what? They may not, but everybody else does. <laughs> I think Larry once said, um, he did make one, he said, like somebody on the Strawberry site, they're like, when I use Perl on Windows, I use Strawberry. And, uh, and some of the Active State people were like, was he trying to slam us or whatever? And I'm like, I probably, it seems like it was put in his mouth because I, I don't think it's something I would look or I said in some kind of context. I don't know. But, yeah. I mean, it's Larry the Chill. Larry the Chill is just like the chill guy. So, anyway, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the more important thing is avoiding his condemnation. <laughs> <laughs> I've never even seen it. I think he cond he condemns people who aren't respectful of other people and their ideas. And no, and you know, he actually doesn't even condemn them. He hugs them, and he's like, "Hug a troll" is his uh, is his theme in the Pearl Six thing because there's people who just want to crap on stuff, and uh, but they just need a hug. And then a lot of times, you know, somebody who's just completely, constantly poisonous. Will eventually get Camellia, the uh, 800 pound uh, butterfly, to crush them. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm done speaking for Larry Wall. <laughs> <laughs> We're going on the record for <laughs> things that Ingi has said that Larry has said. But uh, I, I'll get Larry's blessing next week in Tokyo. Awesome. Okay, so so um, we should probably end this call here pretty soon because we've been going for three hours. Yep. Um, my my final thing that I just wanted to sort of get out of this was a better understanding for my own self, and then a, hopefully some posterity for everyone else of what direction I should try and keep pushing this in, um, because I. I wasn't totally clear on a lot of stuff. I had some misconceptions that are now, um, I think, I think cleared up. Um, what is the overlap? This will be my last big question. What is the overlap between what the guts approach wants to do and what the non-guts approach wants to do? Is there any actual code or design stuff that would be shared between y'all? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's like, yeah, the PMC files. <coughs> Which ones? The, uh, the PMC files. The intermediate representations. Yeah, and that's just very. And that's a design. Yeah, thing. all you do is you put like some flag up at the top saying this is one way or another. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> whenever I use a term like that, yeah. it's dollar flag. Okay, yeah. I don't mean like a Boolean flag. I just mean a uh, an indicator. Yeah. 
There you go. C three I I two I use V six. No, it's just it's it's valid. It's a semicolon. It, it oh, must, okay. The problem is it must be valid in that time frame because the five will require statement knows it. So it yeah. must, it must understand just a, and it must be valid in curl code because curl still tries to load the PP files before it tries to load TM files because the famous compiled code over us. That's good. So we can use it. And currently only bind only uses it and this model compile uses it. Okay. And the idea is to extend it for different purposes. Yeah. So then so um, we can have two independent projects happening as long as they're sharing that abstract syntax tree representation. No, nope. that's not even that. No. It's just the file. It's just the first line of a file. It's just the end of the yeah. <laughs> the rest is completely free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would like Rainey to start thinking of um, of his work as the optimized VM. And it would be interesting to have the um, to be at least be able to set up a, a Perl where you have the old VM and the optimized VM. Yeah, I have several approaches also. I have still optimizing here, optimizing here. Yeah. I don't care about this one. Right. Um, and I'm also caring about this. Since you were talking about, we're intertwined between the bottom two circles. Yeah, it's crazy. And, yeah. You need because to kind of make. This is compile time. Everything I can optimize here, we then will then run faster. And I can prepare this one also to run faster with more information here. But I also want to make. This but one if we faster. could, if we could do that whole thing, as um. As loaded from externally compiled files into an optimized thing, at least for maybe one Perl release, to see if it works before we go bugging the the P5P for anything. Yeah. It might just be. Yeah, yeah sure. I'm, 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 first, I will come up with uh, benchmarks. Yeah. So, yeah, that I guess the question I probably should have asked was, what do you guys need from each other for these two different approaches to not be redundant or incompatible. An IRC channel. <laughs> Hilarious. But yes, I realize you're probably being serious. I'm always being serious. Yeah. And facetious. And full of, yeah. No, I, I actually, ideas. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, Audrey and I used to say the most ridiculous things to each other for hours at a time, and we were serious about every one of them. You know, I mean, it's just. That's, and that's, that's how the world way, came into being. That's the way it goes. Um, Okay, so uh, so all you need to do is just communicate with one another. There's no major design overlaps that are going to keep one of you from doing what you need to do. No. The problem is this one, the fake understanding of this one, because they think of this as a big thing, but it's in reality it's a small thing. It's just nothing. It types. It's only about 10 or 20 percent of the work, and they think, oh, it will take everything. And it's but it's only for interfacing and for some esoteric optimizations. So Does it bleed into the source code at all? It's optional, optional. so you don't care. I see. Okay. Yeah, so but but aren't they like never ever going to accept that? Again, that's what everyone yeah. complains to me about. We it's hate Rainy because he wants us to use types and and it's never already gonna... have it. Nobody has to care. So we already support it. How do we already support it? It's already in compat things. It's already passed and it's already there. All the information is already there, so they, they don't have to get. Oh, right. The I was things. reading what you wrote on that. The problem is, it's only this My is poo the dollar. Problem. The problem is the glues that come up with some methods and names, arguments, and signatures, and they have no idea about types, so they will lose types here. Uh, they will just, they will Were you able to talk to them at the Moose conference? Yeah, but they still don't see the point. So they, they are refusing first here, they are refusing accounts or this RO or something like this, and they are refusing some PIP idea. So, and, and, but can't and, you just. Um, and the better parts are even this one, uh, let's say. Ins, uh, but hold on a second, Rainy. Like, if you can default normal Perl, can't you just see what they come up with? 
and do the same thing with moose. It's just a fault moose somehow. In other words, you only have to solve the problem once. Whatever crap they come up with, if they don't play along with you, then you just write one layer once to deal with moose. They don't see that no, no, I understand. Yeah. And say they never do. No, they will do. But it needs two years, I think. Oh, okay. One or two years, and <laughs> I don't really shortcut understand. it. But the problem is it's not shortcut at all. And then the next problem is they already came up with the, with the discussion now, so they are already. <clears throat> And and twelve six and everybody who knows about it fully fully agrees with me. The problem is that twelve five has no idea about it. I have a question for Will. So I I, I want to know kind of. So my guess is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm probably wrong, but is is that like uh, your CTO of a company that has a lot of curl code and it's not running as fast as you need it to run, and you're looking for ways to to do that, um, yeah. Where does that play out? Right. Well, this is something that um, a lot of people have asked me, and there was one very brief logical discussion of that between myself and someone I forgot who on Pro Monks. But um, you know, I've uh, I've got several large Pro code bases. And um, been working on them for you know over a decade, and done four or five total refactorings from the ground up, and used inline C to get twenty percent speed up on some critical parts. And um, and your benchmarkings aren't showing any. Well, you know, so here's the thing: what kind of code would someone have written in Perl that would actually require us to make Perl itself run faster, and the answer is sign an NDA and I'll tell you. <laughs> but the but the but the easier answer and what I actually wrote on Perl Monks in a sort of a general way was I can give you examples of things like, um, for example, this is not necessarily what I've done, but it's a good example. What if you wrote an entire operating system in Perl? Yes, that would be a crazy, stupid thing to do. But what if you did do that, and you spent a long time to do that, and and refactored it a whole, whole lot so that you can't really squeeze much more speed out of it until we do something like make Perl itself run faster? Or other examples would be things like building an artificial intelligence, or building supercomputing high-performance parallel code, or building some code that is not just some CPAN modules, and it's not just some web server, but it's something special and very different. And I have got a lot of code that I've been working on for a long, long time, and I've spent a lot of money and, um, and done all the refactoring that everybody says to do. Right. And, and it's... And, and what I've come to is I'm either going to have to totally rewrite it all in something other than Perl, which I'm not going to do, <coughs> or make Perl run faster, which I am going to do. I did. Yes. What was it? Uh, I'll talk about all that stuff later. Later. Then. Okay. And so. Because it is NDA stuff. I can't actually okay. tell you what code I have. And actually, I yeah, I ran it with Valgrind, and I think I started using NYT prof, and I didn't get so far where I can tell you exactly what what ones needed to be done, but we could probably discover that. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. And I didn't get that. Oh yeah, I. I yeah, I didn't do that. No. Because no. what I see is like, I mean, this is a great discussion because we're talking about opening the doors. The futures. I don't think of the future, but as various futures. Um, but I don't know that, like, and I think that your problems will be solved by these futures. I think I so. I just don't know that these futures come before you die. So, <laughs> uh, well, just I'm um, just to let you know, I do not ever intend to die. So okay. great. we great. have great. some time, but I do want it done before next summer. Okay. So that we can release it at YFC here in you know, Austin. We, well, here. So what I'm saying is, the stuff that I'm talking about, we can release it by Frozen Pro. I mean, we can release something 
every month. Yes. To a degree. And we can make a big splash about it, but it won't be done. It'll just be, it'll be done, but it'll be at some stage of done. It's like, Baby steps, sure. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then we'll be in a future or several simultaneous futures. But, um, I'm not sure that your, your business needs will be, I'm not sure that this tying your business needs to this stuff is, I think it should be kept separate. Well, I have, I've got, um, one of the people on here is Dan Hartman. Wave, Dan. Yeah, Dan is working on uh, one of my new Perl code bases with me that, you know, I can wait a year to get any, to even care about that running faster because it's new. Okay. Then I've got my old Perl code bases that are just sitting there waiting to make me a millionaire until they run super fast. Okay. And so again, my, I, I came to the um, inescapable conclusion that I would have to completely re-implement everything um, in C, basically, or make Perl run faster. And I'm very resistant towards rewriting it all in C because actually I'm, I'm not convinced that that would even be possible because it was hard enough to create it in Perl. So yeah. creating it in C might actually be more difficult than making Perl run faster, as crazy as that may sound. Not crazy. So I, it makes me feel like I have no choice but to make Perl run faster, which is also exciting because it's such a big, scary project that if we actually made it kind of sort of work in some way, then we could all be heroes. Well, we already are. Uh, well, I, I, w I know I am. No, I was no, wondering no. about you guys. Yeah, talking. So yeah, I. My uh, code runs. My code runs. <laughs> my code runs. Yeah, but everybody hates you. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Screw those people. My code runs. I have no idea. No, oh, you need to hit them on the head. People love Angie because they love the hating. It's like a love hate. It movie. is. You know? But it's fine. Um, it's like, uh, everybody loves Flavio. <laughs> everybody loves Flavio. Isn't that a, a hit sitcom? Um, okay. Uh, it's funny final that. Uh, Go ahead, Flavio. Final yeah. thoughts. <laughs> I'm the optimization guy at my company. And uh, we are not even thinking of using Perlito for that. But that would be cool. Um, back, back up. Back yeah, say up. that again. Uh, I said that uh, I'm basically the optimization guy at my company. And what company is that, Flavio? Uh, Booking.com. And <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Just okay. we just wanted that on the record. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so we, we do have lots of problems, and uh, I, I can see what you, what you need. And, um, yeah, uh, I just uh, uh, wanted to say that for a restricted, like a smaller subset of Perl, uh, Perlito used to be like three times faster than uh, Perl, but uh, only a subset. For uh, for full support, uh, there are many things that you you need to give uh, give like. Uh, I think uh, reference counting is w one of the. Node.js. Uh, on which VM was it on Node? In Node, yes, and al also in uh, in uh, SBCL Lisp, it was pretty fast. Oh, SBCL. Okay. Um, but for example, for uh, reference counting. Uh, you need to implement it at, at a high level. If you are going to the JVM, it, it, you need to track the, the references yourself. Uh, so, yeah, I don't see how to get 100% compatibility and speed. Well, I don't, I don't see it yet. Uh, but, yeah, maybe something like... Uh, uh, Use uh, GC and a mode like we we have uh, MRO module in uh, in Pro5, and people are using that. 
uh, maybe we can have something like uh, use uh, no ref count or something like uh, use GC. Yeah. I don't know. Use GC no ref count. Or yeah, there there are ways to to declare that that you want to give uh, give up on on some features, and and then uh, you get more optimization. Um, for existing code, uh, I think uh, uh, Rainy is is the guy. <laughs> like uh, uh, for new code, I think. Uh, the approach that uh, Ingi is uh, proposing is the best. Maybe, maybe that is actually an even better discernment between the two approaches. What, what can we do about existing code, and what can we do about new code? Maybe that's an even better di uh, divergence between the two approaches. Yeah, I mean, so you do both. I mean. It's not one, you keep kind of pitting one versus the other. It's like they are two separate things. You do them both together. And so you do new code in the Perl 11 way. And um, and the VM that you pass the old, old code to is Rainy's thing, unless it doesn't work on the Rainy's thing. And then you pass it to the backup classic VM, you know, that type of thing. And then you just start seeing um, what next. And you could write like a bot that just goes through every single CPAN module and tests out all of its tests and see if Maybe there's VM it works on. Maybe there's a wrapper ability, stuff, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you have a lot of code to test. Yeah. Which could be automated, perhaps. Yeah, of course, to a degree. Not, still not going to hit every situation. All right, Rainy, final thoughts. Oh, nothing. Nothing. I think I will come up with a good optimizing compiler with some ideas where I have that's a simple solution, but I really want to extend, uh, to have language extensions in the future, which will make Perl compile time optimizable and so much faster. I, I really don't like that Perl is the slowest language, uh, slowest scripting, scripting language out there with no ad advance and not even knowing about it, not even accepting the fact that it's getting slower and slower. So more progress, less uh, back stacking. Back stabbing. Back stabbing. OK. I have one closing statement. It's Ingi's closing statement. Gather round, children. I was going to tell that block, but um, so um, I, I, I would, um, it's really great to, uh, to meet you, Flavio, um, or to talk with you. And um, I would appreciate it if maybe you could um, somehow stay in tune to uh, Pound Pro 11 for a few weeks until we get this somewhat bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. um, if that's okay, so I don't lose touch with you, and um, if if Rainy could never leave, that would be good. <laughs> and uh, so, and all of you, if you could could join in, that would be really great. Was there another uh, Rainy? Did you have another IRC channel you wanted to use, or are we all going to go into the Perl eleven channel now? There's P six per P five, which is this idea of bringing Perl five Perl six together, which isn't really what we were talking about tonight, it, it, we, we no. touched on it in various degrees. P65 is more like passing the five to six. It's more about the bringing them together as a community yeah. effort. But that is related to what we're doing. It's related. Yeah, you should, you should, if you're interested in that, you should join that. But, but it's a different project in that it needs a different Perl channel. And it's Perl 11 is about getting this pluggable VM multiple um, environment in the same process thing going. That's overlapping because that's the same goal for NQP. For what? NQP. That's NQP the cast. But that's Perl 6 on top. No, yeah, but it, it, in a sense. Mm, it could, it and, could and, be anything. It could and there's nothing wrong with overlap, so I, I will yeah. join. Uh, is there a pound NQP? It's, 
it's basically NQP runs currently only on top of Parrot, and they want to run on top of JDM. Okay. So it's a same thing. So they're related. And on top of that, pass Perl 5 and Perl 6 together. So P5 grammar and P6 grammar uh, compile into P6 model. P6 model is the Perl 6 object model. Okay. And which is running on top of MDB. That's the idea. Okay. Well, I definitely need to read up on that completely. I mean, I've yeah. known about NQP for several years, but I wasn't really aware of the scope of the project. I thought it was more of a Perl 6 bootstrapping thing. Yeah, it's a bootstrap. But it's the basis to get rid of power. Right, which we don't want to do, right? No, it's not. Right, wink, wink, it's, wink it's, nudge, nudge. It's, it's parallel. So it's not okay. abandoning it. It will, uh, NQP will always need power to bootstrap. It's right. just to have alternatives. Like, we are talking about switching, but it's not realistic to switch to this. It's just to try it. They want to try this before. Right. Or LLVM. I, I, will, I will try the LLVM. But I think the MQP is Perl 6 driven largely, and yes. Perl 11 is Perl 5 driven. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's also here now. That's as God is my witness, I will start only using Perl 6 as soon as this whole thing actually works. No, Perl 6 and works. Is it faster? And once we get, better? once we get, what I mean works is CPAN and all of my old code running in Perl 6, so I have to rewrite it up. If I'm going to rewrite it, I'll rewrite it. I don't want to rewrite it. That's the point. Well, let's yeah. get it working by the end of the year, really slowly. Yeah. Which year? Which year? Yeah. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we should probably close it down now. Any other final comments from anyone? Okay, well, let's give ourselves a round of applause. Yay! We just changed the history of the future. Of the night. Of the night. All right, say good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. All right, bye.